welcome friends. You are listening to the Mind Body Alchemy podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Miramontes. This is where intuition meets education in the realms of spirituality, fitness, mindset, and more, all to create lasting change. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. I am so excited today because I have a very special guest with me. This is an incredible woman. I know you are going to get so much from this conversation. Her name is Jennifer Arthurton. She is the host of Old Chicks No Shit podcast. And if you have not listened to this podcast yet, you have got to spend some time, go to Apple or wherever you listen to your podcast and subscribe right away because it has some incredible information. I know you'll get a ton out of it. I get a ton out of it and I can't recommend it enough. So I am super excited to have her visiting with me today. We are going to talk about why you get stuck in midlife and what to do about it. So welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Thank you so much. And thank you for that glowing review of my podcast. (laughs) I'm glad you enjoy it. I love it. And I have, not only do I love listening to you, but you have incredible guests. I have reached Mm. out to more than one of your guests and just said, this is such a great podcast. And I really enjoyed your interview because you just bring on really uh, insightful people. I just really enjoy it. So so yeah, I'm excited. (laughs) Excellent. I would love for my listeners to get to know you a little bit better and just wondering how you got started down this path of Mm. midlife work and finding this very special group of particularly women to work with that feels like to me, sort of the ignored or invisible group of of Mm -hmm. people. So I think this work is really important. Yeah. So as with many (laughs) people who find their way, it, this work really came out of my own experience and my own story. So after a 30 year, can't believe I'm that old, but 30 year career in corporate uh, marketing, you know, where I did all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. Like, you know, I went to school, I got a good job. I rose through the ranks and I kind of got to the top of my profession and I was looking around and thinking like, Am I, like, is this what I wanted? Like, is this what I want to be doing for the rest of my life? And really just kind of questioning. And that questioning went on for quite a few years. But like many of us who have these like little nudges and things come up, I completely ignored it. In fact, I not just completely ignored it. I actively pushed it away because I'm like, I'm too busy. I got stuff to do and I didn't want to pay attention. Yeah. So um, as life likes to do when you are not listening, <laughs> <laughs> it, it finds ways to get your attention. And so at the age of 50, I found myself divorced, unemployed, an empty nester. So my daughter had moved three, three hours away to go to school. And I was bedridden with a pretty serious stress related illness. And mm. it was literally as though every identity that I thought I had in the world had, was stripped away from me like literally within the span of a probably about a year. So I was no longer a wife. I was no longer a mom or an active mom, right? I was no longer a corporate executive. And, you know, I was a bit of a gym rat before that. I couldn't even get up and go to the gym. So everything that I thought defined who I was in the world was literally stripped away from me. So there I was lying in my bed, having a big old pity party (laughs) and a lot of why me's. And I realized that I had no idea who I was. I had, you know, I was facing this this daunting prospect of having to reinvent my whole life, basically at the age of 50, and I had no idea what I wanted. So it took like months and months and months of me feeling very sorry for myself and literally thinking my life was over because, you know, the cultural narrative tells you if you're a 50 year old woman, you basically at that age are waiting to ride off into the sunset you know, with a handsome man and live happily ever after. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what a sunset is. I don't have the man. Like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Like, And even while I really was questioning whether there was a next chapter for me, there was a part of me that just knew there was. Like, I knew that there was, like, some part of me knew that there was more that I had to do and to give in this world. And so after months and months of, like I said, throwing a big old pity party and feeling very sorry for myself, I decided to look for inspiration about what was possible. Like, where are other women? There has to be other women who are starting over and changing their lives at this age. Like, where are they? And when I started to look around, I was like, 
didn't really see much that was inspiring. Like, you know, again, media portrayals of women in their 50s is all about, you know, bladder leakage protection, meal replacement shakes, vitamins so you can keep up with your gang kids. And I was like, right, um, I get it. But that's not me. <laughs> right. So there right. has to be something else. And I started the Old Chicks No Shit community because I wanted to provide the inspiration that I was searching for when I was in that place. Like when I was feeling stuck and lost and overwhelmed about what was next for my life, I wanted to create that for other women. And so it has become a community and a podcast, basically just showcasing stories and, you know, information for women that would, they would find helpful in terms of how they, what they want to create for their next chapter. So what you have done is provided a resource, wonderful vault of inspiration, the kind of inspiration that you were looking for when you were kind of floundering around going, Mm -hmm. okay, somebody give me an example here. That example didn't exist. And you're like, cool to hell with it. I'll create that example. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. (laughs) That was, that's amazing. Yeah. And the other part too, is like the, you know, I became very conscious of the messaging that was coming to us from the world about what it means to be a woman in aging. And again, it was all very anti this, anti that don't look your age. And none of it was about the knowledge, the wisdom, the experience that's so incredibly valuable. And I mean, the whole, the name old chicks, no shit literally is a reminder that like we've been around the block a few times and that even though we may be discounted because of our age or our wrinkles or our gray hair or whatever it is, we still have so much to offer the world. And it's really about refocusing from what it is that we're losing at this time of our lives to what it is that we have, what we own and what we have to give. I love that. And I don't know if this is intentional for you. I never heard you say that it was intentional, but when I read old chicks, no shit, it's spelled no as in knowledge, right? Yeah. But in my mind, I always am like old chicks, no shit. Like we are not taking any shit. We have this like... There's no, no more, right? Like I'm not taking your shit anymore. So I don't know if there was a double meaning there or not, but I feel that when it comes to what you put out into the world. I wish I could say that I was smart enough to have come up with that double meaning in that way, but it was only after the fact where I was like, oh yeah, it it kind of fits too, but yeah, no, it wasn't intentional. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. So there were a few things that you said as you were talking about your story and one of them was you were climbing the corporate ladder and you got this nudge this idea that maybe this isn't what you wanted and you know you and I both probably would use the language there was some intuition speaking there and you know whatever language anybody resonates with you can you can call it what you want but that's where that's where I feel the most connected and so can you tell me if you experienced any of the, the narrative that's like, well, you should just be grateful for what you have. Mm. Like, why are you, why are you complaining or why do you want something more when more is already on your plate? Or was it just kind of like, I literally don't have the capacity to think beyond just tomorrow. Yeah. And it's so interesting because a lot of what you just said is the reason why I ignored my own intuition. And and at the time it was happening, I wouldn't even have called it intuition because I was so disconnected from myself that it was like, what's wrong with me? Why shouldn't I be grateful? Because if you looked at my life from the outside, like I had a fantastic job. I traveled a lot. We we had a nice little family and then the white picket fence. I earned really great money. And from the outside, you'd be like, wow, that's a pretty fantastic existence. And I kept trying to rationalize why I didn't feel like I was 100% grateful. And yes, I was grateful, but there was still something that felt really misaligned. And that was the part that I couldn't bring myself to honor because one of the big reasons was if I honored that, then I had to face what I call, what I work with my clients on, right, is the void, right? So the place between no longer and not yet. So if I'm not doing this now, like what am I doing, right? Mm. And like staring into that void feels very, very, very uncomfortable. Like you literally have no control of everything. And again, coming from a society where we are taught to control everything, (laughs) Mm-hmm. Not, it's not a place that we want to be. And so I, I, I ignored it for a long time for that very reason and kept saying, you should be really grateful. You should be grateful. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah. 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 And and it's like you mentioned, it's not that you weren't 
grateful. And, and I think that that is some of the language that shuts us down, our intuition down is the guilt that, okay, there's, there, there can be space. Two things can be true at the same time. Yes. I can have gratitude and I can desire more, but we've been conditioned to think that whatever we can get, whatever table scraps, whatever, you know, and if we get more than table scraps, we should be really grateful about that. Yeah. Like you said, you are making good money. You are doing the thing. And so, you know, you weren't burnt toast. Why are you treating yourself like burnt toast? You know, like what, like yeah. you said, what's wrong with you? Yeah. And we just have this struggle to hold these two truths that yeah. nothing is wrong with me. I'm super grateful for where I am. It's brought me here. And I know there's more. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's, and it's really like honoring, and especially as we get to midlife, like more importantly than ever, it's about honoring what's happening inside you, like honoring your intuition, honoring your inner voice, because in that place is where we find our gifts, where we find our most authentic self. And I mean, I will say for myself, I was doing all of the things that I thought I should be doing you know, like from the time I got into school, get good grades, go to a good school, get a good job, right? Like do all the things, work your way up. But never on that path did I stop to check in to say, but is this what you want? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So then you get to this place, you know, and again, I had 30 years in my career, I had invested a lot, right? You get to that place. And then you're like, okay, well, I can't do anything now because it's too late right? Like I've got 30 years in here. So it's that kind of that sunk, sunk cost fallacy, right? That you can't change something because you've already put too much in it. But I yeah. mean, the beauty of life is you can change anything at any point at any age, <laughs> right? That is the beauty of life. And I don't yeah. think that people see that. I think that they do see what you described before as how much have I invested? And if I change my mind, that somehow makes me wrong or yes. makes me feel like I have wasted my life or yes. wasted my time. When the reality is that's not actually what is happening. It's just, this was one season and seasons yeah. sometimes change and yeah. you reserve the right to change your mind as often as it, you know, lights a fire up your ass, I guess. <laughs> exactly. And, and the thing is too, for us to recognize that we are not supposed to be the same women from the beginning to the end of our lives. Like you said, there are seasons, right? And sometimes seasons require different things of us. And that's yeah. why it's so important that we honor whatever's coming up for that particular season. I mean, now I look back on all of the experiences that I had in my life and like, I can see exactly how I was being set up for what I'm doing now. Unfortunately, it took a little bit of a brick in the head to get me onto that path, right? Yeah. What is it they say life gives you like is a, like a poke and then it gives you a shove. And then if you're still not listening, you get the brick in the head. Well, that was me, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and now I see exactly how everything was lining up for me to become the woman that I am today. Right? So yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom to be gained from what feels like our most broken places. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We tend to make it mean something about us. You know, we tend to come up with this story or this narrative that something is wrong with us, but there is so much learning usually that happens when we gain a new perspective, when we get on the other side of it, when we've, you know, finally surrendered to mm. the achiness, to the feelings, to the emotions and stopped shoving them, stopped hiding from them sort of like you said, get the brick in the head and, and finally recover from that, then the, it seems like the wisdom is on the other side of that. And Oh, a hundred percent, 100%. I mean, I, you know, I have met parts of myself that I didn't even know existed. And there are parts of myself that I love and honor so much now, but had things not transpired the way they were, I could have gone my entire life with not knowing that that part of me existed. Yeah. And it's such a beautiful thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like to come into full alignment with who you are on all, at all levels. Right. So with that in mind, why do you think, or um, maybe what thoughts do you have about the reasons that women tend to, and maybe it's people in general tend to not be in tune with who they really are, what their desires are as they go through these periods until they have the brick in the head or until they reach that mm -hmm. life stage where all their identities are kind of stripped away and they're looking into the void. 
Yeah, I mean, the number one reason, and I think this is, I think it's true for everybody, but I think it's especially true for women is that we are so busy doing, doing, doing for others that we have, and we are last on our list if we're even on the list. And in the process of making everybody else happy, like our, you know, from our parents to our kids, to our spouse, to our career, everybody, anything else, we've become so disconnected from ourselves right? Like if you ask a lot of women, and I hear this all the time when I talk to my clients, like, what do you want? They can't answer the question because they've never really connected in to see, okay, what about me? Like what makes me happy? What brings me joy? What fills me up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like it's, we need, there's some, we need to be less doing and more being. And it's like the first thing that I work with on my clients is about connection and getting really deeply connected with you right? Learning to put up boundaries, you know, to carve out time for yourself, right? Learning to put your needs like on the list and maybe even ahead of a whole bunch of people on the list, right? To, To create enough space that you don't need a brick in the head to have to come to terms with who you are, that you can gradually build on your inner world, your inner experience, your intuition, your thoughts to, to figure out who you are and what you want. And yeah. I think it's the number one reason we feel we, we are disconnected in midlife is because like all of a sudden relationships change, careers change, kids leave home. All of a sudden there's not so much doing anymore. And again, we're staring into what I call the void, right? Like, yeah. oh, okay, now there's nothing in front of me. What am I going to do? And it's a really, really uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. Yeah. That is a really uncomfortable place to be. Anytime I find that a core belief I'm a mother, I'm a wife, these are my roles in the world, get yeah. shaken up, like yeah. maybe your religious beliefs change, whatever it is, your diet beliefs change, all of these things kind of shift and you're like, huh, okay, now I'm stuck in that void that you describe. And it does feel like the ego is left unattached, that we have, we just kind of lost whatever kind of Legos built us. And now we're just kind of stuck deciding who we want to be in the world yeah, and have forgotten, I guess, that we were a whole human before we took on all of this and we're still a whole human after it and outside of it. And we just kind of forgot to acknowledge, I guess, our wholeness while we were doing all of the things and serving all of the people. Yeah. If, you know, in many cases, if we ever knew our wholeness, because, you know, for a lot of us, we get programmed or indoctrinated into that. I must make everybody else happy for like long, like as girls even, right? Don't rock the boat. Don't speak your truth, you know, play nice. Right. And so we're trained very early on to not put ourselves on the list. Right. And then, you know, we, we conflate the roles we play with who we are in absence of anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, like for me, that was probably the biggest lesson was separating, you know, like my, you know, my career, my, my relationship, my duties as a mom, even my body, right. With, with those things aren't me, like they just aren't. And that was a process. Like that was a a bit of a process that uh, took some time. Yeah. So we use all of these things to paint our picture of worthiness and our picture of value and so value 100%. Yeah. 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 So so I just kind of had this aha moment where I am picturing myself looking into this void and thinking instead of yes this is uncomfortable but instead of going down this doom and gloom it feels maybe exciting because this is a new opportunity to start shaping and and get curious and start learning about myself and I think I think that's confronting, but also kind of thrilling to know that that's out there. Yeah. And that's literally the work that I do is helping to shift that perspective because it's an opportunity for creation, right? Like to create ourselves, like, who do I want to be? Like, what's pulling me? And then what do I, like, how do I want to live? What do I want to create in the world? What do I want to do? You know? And when you look at it from that perspective, there's so much power in that to be able to own, like fully own and be fully responsible for the creation of a life, but also scary, especially when we've never been taught of our, when we've never been taught our power. Right. Yeah, that is, yeah, yeah. That's really exciting. 
And there's another layer, especially for mothers that, you know, you kind of mentioned like, okay, and then you're a grandmother and you wear diapers and you take your vitamins and all of these things where that is also indoctrinated into our psyche. That is also the narrative that, okay, well now my kids have left for college and they're starting to get married and they're starting to do all of the things. So my, my job is just to wait it out so that I can then become grandmother of the year and babysitter of the year and all of these things where I just, I don't quite let go of the identity that I did my part. I raised my kids, of course, you know, helping is fine. And if that's what you love to do, that's wonderful too. But, but it's not a sentence that you have to fulfill. Like that is not your job. It's a choice. Yeah, that beautifully said. And, you know, the job of us in midlife is literally to pick up all of the pieces of energy that we have scattered everywhere across everyone and everything to collect back all of those pieces of energy and then to refocus them onto ourselves. And when you talk about that conceptually, you know, the word selfish comes up, Mm. right? Oh, well, selfish, right? So, you know, I have a a love-hate relationship with the word selfish, right? Like we are supposed to be selfish. This is the time of our life to be selfish, to focus on our wants, our dreams, our desires, our passions, like nature intended it to be this way. Right. Right. Like everything, you know, like when our value is, you know, again, conflated with our ability to have kids and how our bodies look and things like that. Right. And then we come into this place where you no longer look the way that you did. You know, you're not raising kids anymore. You can't even have kids anymore. Like mother nature didn't make a mistake and then put us out to pasture. Like she didn't. What she said is, wow, I'm going to give you time and space because you are a powerful woman, right? To then, to, to be a, a leader, a way shower, a guide for what's possible. So it's, you know, and it's not a mistake. We're not put out to pasture because mother nature, oops, I forgot that part. (laughs) So (laughs) it works. (laughs) I got chills just hearing you talk about gathering up all of that energy to refocus into back into our own lives because we do give out so much energy and it's a beautiful gift. And it's something that, you know, we should recognize not as like, this is some big obligation, but we are donating all of these pieces of our lives in order to, you know, serve others or give the most of ourselves to everyone else. And so reclaiming some of that just feels really powerful to me in concept. Yeah, for sure. For sure it is. And the other part is like learning to receive, like learning to be able to receive gifts from ourselves, like our energy and our time, right? When we're so used to giving, Mm. we've never actually learned how to receive right? So being able to say, okay, now I deserve this and I'm going to take it all back and I'm going to use it for, for what's important to me. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you say to the woman that has that conditioning that selfishness is a negative trait to have, that it's, you know, something that should be frowned upon and that she was just put on this earth to serve and decay, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because a lot of women who end up in my community or who end up as my clients, by the time they come to me, they are in this place where they know they want something more, but like, I hear this all the time, I just don't have the energy. Like, I literally don't have the time or the energy to be able to figure out how to do this thing. And, you know, my response to them is, well, that makes perfect sense because you've been you know, giving, giving, giving without ever refilling your own cup, right? Like, okay, we talk about spa days or, you know, like, and all of that's great. Like we need it hanging out with our friends and those do recharge us a little bit, but it goes so much deeper than that. Like, it's about like honoring who we are, like honoring our intuition, honoring our desires, right? Those are the things that, that fill you back up, right? So when you come to this place, like your survival and your next chapter absolutely requires you to be selfish. It requires you to put yourself on the top of your list. It requires you to start listening in to who you are and what's coming up for you, right? Honoring your values and your truth. And if you can't, and if you don't do that, like you will end up on the same train like I did to burnout, 
Like, and yeah. sometimes that does materialize in illness or depression or weight gain or like whatever it is, but the, we can't go on ignoring ourselves without having some consequence. So it's yeah. a necessary survival. And if selfish is a word that, you know, turns people off, off, it's just like, okay, I'm just going to, again, reclaim my energy, or I'm going to fill my own cup for a minute so that I can go on because serving from a place of duty and obligation is depleting of energy. But when you serve from a place of joy and authenticity, you're actually refilling your cup as you're doing the thing that you're doing. And that's why it's so important. So, you know, most of us end up in a place of depl depletion before we realize how important it is to start, you know, um, putting ourselves on our list. Yeah. I think you said something really important there. There was a distinction between sort of giving everything away versus showing up in service from a place of love and authenticity. And it reminds me of the conversation that I have with clients about people pleasing, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're saying exactly. yes to everything because you don't want to hurt feelings, it just means you're willing to hurt your own, right? Yeah. If you're willing to just do all of the things, it just means that you're unwilling to value your own time and your own energy and the reality is that if you learn to say no in a way that honors and respects the request, then you do get some of that energy back. You can mm -hmm. show up your friends and family and the people who are asking things of you know that when you say yes, it's a yes from your soul because yeah. you've said no enough times that, that your yes really means something. And that is energizing. Yeah. That is a and different, even a completely different energy. Totally. And, and the other thing I would do, I would put on that is like asking for help, right? Like we as women, we're really bad at asking for help because we feel like we have to do it all for everybody. And, you know, like I, <laughs> I've now become the asking for help, like the delegation ninja, because when I finally tweaked at like, oh, wait, I don't have to do this myself. You know, yeah. like, you know, my dad was in hospital and I was the one going to the hospital twice a day. And I was starting to get resentful. I was starting to get angry. And I'm thinking, okay, this is really that. And then I'm beating myself up for feeling resentful and angry for, you know, <laughs> visiting my dad in the hospital. And then I finally realized that I was like, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to do this. So like, I pick up the phone and I call the people and go, okay, can you go this day? You go this day, this, and everybody was happy. The job got done and I didn't burn myself out in the process of doing it. So it's things like that, where asking for help, asking for support, like you said, putting the boundaries, I can't do this today, but maybe I could do this two weeks from now. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Not feeling we have to do everything you know, 100% by ourselves. We're not meant to. And, yeah. And offering alternatives. You know, I actually yeah. can't show up to six meetings, but I will 100% be there this one and this one. Yeah. Or I definitely can't bake a fresh cake for this event, but I will pick one up at the store on the way over if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> offering some kind of alternative. Like this is what I have the capacity to give and what I'm willing to give without stressing myself out and putting myself last and exhausted, yeah. like missing my workout because now I have to bake this cake that I didn't want to bake from scratch or <laughs> whatever, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Glennon Doyle has a quote in her book, Untamed, that goes something along the lines is that your job in this life is to disappoint as many people as po as you have to, to avoid disappointing yourself. And I'm like, I love it. back to that one all the time because it's just so powerful. <laughs> that is so good. She yeah. comes up with some good stuff. Doesn't she? Yeah. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so when we talk about getting stuck in midlife, then what do you think is, how do we know we're stuck? What are some of the first initial ways that we can start to unstick? Is it conversations that we need to have? Is it sitting in stillness and writing a list? What does that actually look like from an action standpoint? Yeah, so I have a five step process that I work with my clients through. And the first one, the very first one that we talked about before is creating connection for yourself. So uh, the work I do is all about connection, clarity, and courage. So getting connected with yourself to figure out, you know, who you are, what, and then getting clarity on what you want, and then finding the courage to step forward into it. So the very first step is carving out time either meditation, walks in nature, like whatever works for you to just start to tune in with you. Like, what are your thoughts and feelings? What's, what are the little nudges that you've been ignoring? Like, and journaling is really powerful 
a really powerful way to you know get things out of your head and put it on paper because in our head things are very easy to dismiss but when you write it down and now you know it's like living somewhere outside of your head it becomes that much more real so you know i encourage my clients first of all is to you know carve out that daily practice 5 10 even if it's three minutes to start with, like whatever feels manageable for you, start there to create create that time to connect in with yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, do the journaling. Like what is that little nudge that keeps coming up that you keep dismissing? Write it down. And then the next time you come down back to your journal, maybe you build on that or maybe you just write it again. But whatever it is, you're kind of cementing it a little bit. You're giving it time and space to grow as opposed to dismissing it the instant that it pops into your head. Yeah. And then the second thing is about checking the stories that you tell yourself. So often what happens is, you know, this thing pops up and immediately following that thing is, oh, I can't do it because I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough education, whatever it is. And it's important to catch ourselves in those stories. And then rather than taking it as truth is to question it say to yourself, you know, is, do I know this to be hundred percent true? Right. Is there a way that I can work with this? Like, is there a way I can find the time? Is there like, and start just exploring possibilities as opposed to taking this as gospel truth. One of the, the stories after I got divorced was like around my own finances. Right. I had always said, like, I have a marketing degree. Like that's what I did is marketing. So I'm arts and crafts. I'm not math. And when it came mm. to taking care of my own finances, I had a lot of fear and resistance to it because I kept telling myself, but I'm not good at math. I'm just not good at math because, and then, you know, like a teacher back in grade four told me I'm not so good at math. And I've been carrying this with, I let my husband take care of all of the finances because I wasn't good at math. Turns out I'm actually not bad at math. I just have <laughs> never given myself the chance to actually prove it, to try, right? Yeah. So really tuning in to those stories. We think something like 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day and 95% of them are repetition. So we like to stay in this loop, in the same loop. Yes. And as soon as you start to question those thoughts, then all of a sudden you've created a pattern interrupt, which is enough space for you then to be like, hmm, maybe I could still try this. Or maybe I wasn't good at math back then, but I might be better at math now. Right. Yeah. So really just kind of diving into what it what is the story that we use to squash our, our initial idea. The third thing is per giving ourselves permission to dream. So this is something that we as adults have labeled unproductive, you know, daydreaming, any number of things, but it doesn't belong anywhere in in our reality. And yeah. the powerful part about dreaming is, you know, allowing ourselves to create a vision of what we want, you know, to spend time in that vision, to, you know, imagine what it feels like, like to really get into the feeling of it, picturing it, who am I with? What am I doing? What's the weather like? Like the whole scenario. It's so powerful because our subconscious brain doesn't know real from imagined. I don't know if anybody's ever listened to Joe Dispenza's work. So good. So good, right? You know, when, when we create that imagination or that vision, right, our brain actually thinks that it's real, like we've done this before. And so unconsciously and subconsciously, we start searching out ways and means for us to move closer to that thing, right? So, you know, like 95% of the people who come to me have never actually spent time creating a vision of what it is that they want. Yeah. Like, in fact, maybe even more than that. And I always encourage people to start really small. Like maybe it's a vision of your perfect day, right? Maybe it's a vision of um, what, how you want a specific situation to go, right? It doesn't need to be, okay, I'm going to plan every day for the rest of my life. And here is what it looks like. Start small and like play with that part of your brain again. Like give it stimulation, like let it grow. I mean, there's been so many studies that have showed how important imagination is for our brains. And long past when we are kids, like we as adults can actually do that because without yeah. a vision, it's like trying to drive your car to a destination, but you have no idea where that destination is, right? So you're like, how do I know if I'm on the right road? How do I know when I need to turn right versus left, right? And the fourth thing I talk about always is taking action. The number one way to get out of overwhelm or feeling stuck is to take action. 
And unfortunately, yeah. we as humans do this, it's all or nothing. I'm either doing 100% of the thing or I'm doing none of the thing. When the reality is that if we just take the tiniest step that we can imagine in the direction of the thing that it is that we want, we that tiny step will lead to the next tiny step and the next tiny step. And those tiny steps actually lead to huge things. And I think we talked about this before, James Clear book, James Clear's mm -hmm. habit book. So good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Excellent. Um, Highly recommend everyone reads that. Yeah. Atomic habits. So, such a good book, but the, like the idea, like some days we might take leaps and bounds, right? Like we might do three really huge things. And then the next day we just don't have the energy. And so like, we're going to, I always use the marathon example today, we're going to get on and put on our running shoes right? Like we might even go out of the house or maybe we don't, but we didn't do nothing in that direction. So like I have those no zero days mantra, right? Like I have to do something every day in the direction of what it is that I'm trying. Love to that. Okay. I don't want anybody to miss that. Okay. No zero days. I think that that is so, that is a really valuable piece of advice because yeah. you're right. Everyone gets stuck in this all or nothing, this perfection, yeah. this pass or fail, this, if I'm not doing all the things, I might as well do nothing. If I can't do an hour long workout, then I'm definitely not going to do yeah. five squats in my living room. Right. That's not going to be helpful. You know, when in reality, we're not just training what we are doing. We're training our minds to, to drop the resistance and yeah. say, I am going to show up. I may not do everything right. And I may not do everything today, but I will show up every day because this matters to me. So that yeah. your brain stops saying, you have to do it right. You have to do it right. Or don't do it or don't do it. Let's just yeah. delay. Tomorrow is better. Start over on Monday. Yeah. And it's a way of showing up for yourself, even if it's in a tiny, tiny, tiny way, like yeah. showing up for yourself is again, an incredibly powerful tool, like showing up for your dreams and your desires is like it's life changing, right? And it like that commitment is built. Like, you know, like one of the things that I've been struggling with is getting into yoga because like I'm built like a steel beam. And yesterday <laughs> I'm like, God, I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna do it. So I was like, okay, no zero days. So I literally rolled out my mat and I stood on it <laughs> and I stretched my <laughs> arms above my head. And I was like, I think that might be it. And then I was like, that might no. be it. Okay, no, I can do downward dog. I can literally do downward dog for a minute and a half. And then after that, I was like, okay, that's it. That's all I'm doing today. I want to do other things, but I can still check the box to say I did something today. Yeah. But I was like really tired. I just wasn't feeling, you know, yada, yada, yada. But so no zero days is an incredibly powerful tool to move yourself forward. And like the only way to get unstuck is to take action. That's so right. Tiny things lead to big lead to big, big things. Tiny steps lead to big things. And then the yeah. last thing I always say to people is don't do it alone. It's so easy to not show up for ourselves when the only place our dream and our desires live is in our heads. Yes. Right? Like we can, nobody knows if I show up or if I don't show up. Nobody's holding me accountable to this thing. So I recommend, you know, tell a friend, tell your spouse, you know, if, if they're not good people, if they're not supportive, you know, join a group read a book, find yourself a coach, whatever it is, just don't do it alone. Because we as humans are meant to be like, we're pack animals, right? Like we're meant to do things together. And there's so much power in knowing that not only am I showing up for myself, that I'm also showing up in this group and I'm being held accountable. Yeah. So, yeah. So those are the five things that, and th that's the number one reason why women come into my Facebook group is because they're like, okay, I, you know, I told my husband, he laughed at me. So now I want to be in a room with women who are all in the same place, doing the same thing, trying to create something new for their lives. Yeah. So much power and motivation and support in, in finding somebody outside of yourself. Yeah. Finding those people that are willing to be your cheerleaders yeah. and tell you that you can do it and get you out of your own head and just, yeah. Hey, you know, giving you the permission that sometimes you yeah. can't give yourself to, to just take a step and, and do it afraid and do it yeah. with all the resistance and, and work through it because you know, you have a community that has your back and yeah. is not going to shame you or tell you that you suck or whatever, because let's face it, we do enough of that on our own. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> we, we don't need people, you know, saying, well, see, told you you're a loser. You know, yeah. I try to tell people you cannot fail 
even if you do things really sucky, even if you quit and do something else, that's just a reorientation of your priorities. It's still not a failure. You cannot fail. You can mess up, you can stumble, you can take steps backward, but as long as you continue, you're never going to go back to baseline. You are a different person with every decision you make. A hundred percent. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And the other thing too, like they're also willing to find a group of people who are willing to call you out when you need to be called out. Cause sometimes mm-hmm. we need people lovingly saying, but Hey, you said you were going to, how's that going? Right. Yeah. Like some of yeah. that, like, that's the whole reason why I joined mastermind groups is for that very reason, because I want yep. somebody to be able to, when I start to hide, right. Because things are getting hard and scary. I want someone to say, Oh, Hey, how's that thing going? Right. And yep. like, oh crap. Yeah. Okay. Now I need to get back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or lovingly call us in. <laughs> or like, lovingly call us hey, in. Yes. C- come back to where we said we were going here because yeah, exactly. You know, your yes. fear is stopping you. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, then also just that. to re- reflect back to you, sometimes we can't see ourselves clearly enough, right? For somebody to say like, hey, you are more than capable of doing this. You have everything it takes, like, you know, and to reflect back to you things that you're not prioritizing when you're stuck in the I suck mode, right? You just need somebody to see you from a different perspective and remind you of who you really are because you aren't. It isn't I'm all, you know, I suck all the time, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. I would... I would also offer that you learn as you go through these um, sort of transitions to ask for how you need your needs met Mm -hmm. while you're in these processes. So we expect people to kind of read our minds and support us blindly and whatever. And, And so then we might come to them with like a complaint or, you know, a frustrating day. And so they come to solve all of our problems when the reality is we just want somebody to say, I see you. I hear you. I'm sorry. It didn't work out for you. You've got this. It's okay. And so sometimes we need to be able to ask for that kind of support. So true. Um, very directly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And again, yeah. like I said, it comes back to like asking for help, like, you know, asking for what yeah. you need, which is such a foreign concept for, for many of us. Yeah. I have a couple more questions for you if you're okay on time. Yeah, Totally. Okay. So one of them is why is it so important that women at this age stop buying into the idea that we have an expiration date? Why is it so important that we find that intuitive voice that tells us Mm. what, what else there is for us, that we go down the path, that we listen and, and take that first step? Why do we need more women doing this? Yeah. Oh, my favorite thing. I could talk about this all day. I literally (laughs) could talk about this all day. You know, I often say that midlife is actually the most powerful point in your life. There's never been a time in your life before where you have all of the knowledge and the experience and the wisdom lined up. And then, you know, like the time lined up in such a perfect way, because before that, you know, like in previous chapters of our lives, it's, we're so busy caring, raising our families, nurturing, doing, 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 we have a full plate. And that's kind of what we're supposed to be doing for that phase of our lives. This phase of our lives is all about us sharing our gifts with the world. So there's an analogy in that I use all the time from Chinese medicine, where the chi energy, so the chi, which is the energy that goes through the body for the first part of part of our lives, before we reach menopause, the chi energy flows down the body towards the reproductive organs, because that's part of what we do, what we need to be doing as humans. When we hit menopause, coming up to menopause, the chi energy actually reverses and comes up through the body and out through the eyes. And the significance of it in the Chinese culture is for a woman to share her gifts with the world. So we weren't doing, I know, I get chills every time. I love it. Y'all can't see my face, but I'm just like, yes. (laughs) Right. So, you know, again, it's not like a mistake of mother nature that it's all of a sudden we're like, oh, you're, you're, you know, your life ends at 50 and we're just kind of cut you off and send, send you off to pastor. That's not it. It's just that we as a society haven't glommed on yet to the value of what this time is. And as soon as we can see ourselves as valuable outside of our ability to reproduce, outside of how our bodies look, outside of, you know, gray hair and wrinkles, and recognize everything that we have learned and experienced and done and that, you know, the power of our intuition, like all of these things are literally coming together in the perfect storm for us to be like the leaders and guides and way showers. 
it's reflected back to us in nature where, for example, killer whales are the only other mammal to go through menopause. And when they go through menopause, they actually then become, like when they stop reproducing, they become the leaders of the pods. So they guide the pods to safety, to food, they help protect the young. Right. And again, this is our job, like as humans, right, is like as women in midlife is now to step into that role as leader. But we haven't been unfortunately been taught that we are leaders. I love that. And now we get to become the leaders. And some of us change the world, like you said, by choosing to, you know, support our families and maybe look after our grandkids. Others choosing to serve the world through, you know, writing that book that they've always wanted to write or starting a business or creating a charity. But whatever it is, we are giving something back to the world. It's the time and space where we can, you know, create a legacy that's outside of ourselves. Like there's actually a term for it in psychological circle, circles called generativity. And it's the need to have something, you know, we, for all, our, all of our lives, we've been very inwardly focused. And now all of a sudden our focus turns to the broader world and how we can make it a better place. So like, it's so important for us as women to step into this power that we have. First of all, to see this power and to step into this power, because not only are we meant to do this, but we're also, as more and more of us do it, we're changing the paradigm of what it means to be a woman in our culture, right? Like most of us, when we are, you know, when we think as like, you know, we're kids or we're teenagers and we're dreaming about our lives, you know, we dream about our husbands, we dream about the kids that we're gonna have and the job that we're gonna have. And then our dream kind of literally ends when our kids leave home. Yeah. Right? Like, I can't think of too many peep seven-year-olds who said, oh, no, I dreamed about, you know, what I'm going to be when I'm a 60-year-old woman. Like, we just haven't been taught because culturally, we don't even, we're not acknowledging this, this, this stage of life. And it's yeah. so critically important for us to show the generations behind us that there is a much different way to do this phase of our lives it's not about sitting on the you know the rocking chair waiting for the grandkids to visit and if that's what you want to do that's fantastic too but right. you know there's all of these you know strong smart vibrant women like kick-ass women with all of this you know knowledge and wisdom to share with the world and the world needs it like by god if the world has ever needed it more it's now <laughs> yes yes right? and it's both and too, right? We don't have to choose whether or not we want to be nourishing grandmothers and take care of things and also spend time in our creativity and writing books and speaking Absolutely. and showing ourselves to the world. We can do things in seasons. We are not, like I've said before, you know, we're not expiring here. We're renewing. It's a yeah. shedding of the old so that we can rise up in that way. And it just takes really solid boundaries in order to balance both of those things without the burnout of maybe what you experienced before with just doing all the things and taking ourselves out of the equation. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a process of unlearning everything that we've learned, <laughs> how we are supposed to show up as women. Like it literally yeah. is like undoing everything. Yeah. Beautiful. I love that. And then lastly, I probably should have thrown this in the middle somewhere, but do you feel like the obsession with youth, with cosmetic surgery, with always losing weight, with dressing younger, with our obsession with like being someone who's in their fifties and sixties, looking like they could compete with women in their thirties, all that sort of language that we are surrounded with. Do you feel like that is a distraction and harming our ability to appreciate ourselves and actually find these deeper desires within us because it's just another layer of expectation. Yeah, I think you, you just hit the nail on the head. It is a distraction. It's a distraction from the most powerful parts of ourselves. Like, you know, if you go back to the times when women were burned at the stake because people thought they were witches because they had magical powers. It's almost mm. the same thing, albeit in a much less dramatic fashion, <laughs> right? But if we can keep women focused on their gray hair and their wrinkles and, you know, a few extra pounds around the tummy, they're not focused on all of their brilliance, all of their wisdom, all of the knowledge and the ways that they can be impacting the world. Like our yeah. impact in the world is not about how we look. Our impact is yeah. not about our ability to reproduce. That's not it. And the tides are changing and we're starting to see, 
a, a swell in that direction, but for women in general, but I always say like, this means the same thing for women in their twenties and thirties, but it means the same thing for women in their sixties and seventies. Like it doesn't end at 50. So even yeah. like, you know, the women's movements don't often go into that, to that next chapter. Yep. And again, it's so important for us as midlife women to be stepping into that power to say, Hey, look over here. Right. Yeah. And the more of the, the, like the collective power of us all doing it, what in whatever way that looks looks and feels right for us just has a dramatic impact on the world but you're right it's a huge distraction it's a massive yeah. distraction and it we are doing ourselves such a disservice when again our whole you know that our identity and our value is associated with something outside of ourselves and fitting into a society right like where even 30 year olds don't look like 30 year olds anymore <laughs> right <laughs> like <laughs> right you know we're being asked to you know as 50 and 60 year old women to you know live up to standards that even 30 year old women can't live up to like right so yeah it's it's such a huge disservice and you know that is in fact one of the big reasons why I created the community and why I named it old chicks no shit is literally to create that focus on it's not about what's outside of you it's about what's inside of you beautiful I love it yeah Oh, I love it. I think you've created such a wonderful community. I think that you are putting stuff out into the world that everyone needs to hear right now. I think it's so empowering and it just feels like a big hug. It feels like love. And so I just want to thank you for that and let you know that I just think you rock because I didn't say this in the beginning, but Jennifer was a client of mine at one time and we just kind of stayed in touch. And I'm just, I've gotten to watch this evolution kind of as a bystander and I just think you're amazing. So I'm really grateful that you yeah. took the time to visit with me today. I am so glad we had the opportunity to meet. And interestingly enough, you know, like when I came to you, when, when you were my coach, that was kind of at the beginning of where, before everything imploded, where all of a sudden, you know, I was in this stress state, like my body was packing on the pounds. I was trying everything within my power to make sure that that didn't happen. Right. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, you know, when I surrendered to it, it took me gaining like 35 pounds to really fully fall in love with myself and with my body. So there was so much power in that, in that, in that moment of surrender. So anyway, I'm so glad we got, we had the opportunity to come across each other. Um, and I love the work that you're doing as well too. So. Oh, thank you. Well, is there anything that you want to leave my uh, listeners with? I know that you have an intensive coming up this spring, and I know that you have a freebie to sign up on for your newsletter and get all of yeah. this wisdom in your inbox. So tell everyone where they can find you. And yeah, more. so you can find me. My website is oldchicksnoshit.com. So that's K N O W shit.com. And there you can find um, all of the information on my four week upcoming workshop in April, the end of April called the empowerment intensive. And it's a lot of the stuff that we just talked about today and reminding us about how powerful we really are at this time of our lives. I also have a freebie, the five ways to get unstuck and create your kick-ass next chapter. You can access through the website. I'm on Instagram. And then, yeah, I also offer free one hour clarity calls for people who need a little bit of a kickstart to get moving on their, on their creating their, their kick-ass next chapter. So. Yeah. Y'all, if you resonated with what she said today, do not sleep on that. Take that as your baby action and get on the phone with her so that you can kickstart your own journey yeah. and transformation. And do not forget about her podcast because you can find that as well. And I've already plugged that like three times because it's a really good one. So, all right, y'all, thank you so much for joining me today. If you loved this episode, please screenshot it, share it on social media, make sure you tag me at soulcenteredfitness.co and tag Jennifer as well. All that information will be in the show notes as well as how to get in touch with her so that you can get started on your own transformation. I love you all and we will see you next week. Bye.